Good morning, everyone. We will call this meeting of the COVID-19 Mitigation and Management Task Force um, to order. Um, first, let me begin by checking to see if, um, Megan, can you tell me if you can hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. So um, we have, uh, looks like a good group of folks here. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and Call the meeting to order, open agenda item number one, and um, please call the roll, and I am here. Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Caleb Cage, you're here. here. Richard, Richard Whitley? Here. Terry Reynolds? Here. Jamie Black? Here. David Fogerson? Present. Alicia Gonzalez? Brett Compton here. Megan North Ranson here. Chris Late here. Dagny Stapleton um, I don't. I didn't hear you, but I see you. Wesley Harper here. Thanks. I'm here. Uh, Mark Pandori here. Kyra Morgan here. Lisa Sherrick? Here. Julia Peak? Here. Melissa Peak Bullock? Here. Melinda Southerd? Here. Leslie Mullenkamp? Here. And for the record, Samantha Laddick? Here. You do have a quorum. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And thank you all again for um, being here this morning um, for this meeting. And uh, I know we've got a lot of uh, important things to discuss. So we will go from um, the uh, roll call straight into agenda item number two. Um, a reminder that uh, in public comment, we'll, we'll go ahead and open public comment. In public co comment, no action may be taken upon a matter raised under this item of the agenda until the matter itself has been specifically included on an agenda as an item upon which ad action may be taken. Public comments may be limited to two minutes per person at the discretion of the chair. Comments will not be restricted based on viewpoint because there is no physical location for public testimony under this uh, agenda item. Uh, comments under this agenda item may be presented by phone. Um, please note that the instructions for calling in to today's meeting are um, provided on the agenda. And um, as we've done in the past, we're going to go ahead and leave um, the public comments section open um, for long enough to make sure that um, there, there's plenty of time for public comment. Um, I was able to call in a moment ago and um, test the the number, I just wanna state that for the record and, and was allowed in and, and able to um, hear um, during the roll call. So we know that that, that system um, has worked. Is there any public comment that would, uh, that members of the public would like to provide? Please press star six, identify yourself and provide your comment. 
Good morning, um, task force members, Chair Cage. Um, I would like to enter public comment. Yeah, please go ahead. For the record, Anne Marie Filer of 10543 Everhart Bay Drive, Las Vegas, Nevada. Representing B&G Telecom, a certified uh, woman-owned and operated telecom services company based out of Clark County, Nevada. I'm also representing the concerns of NATE, the Communications Infrastructure Contractors Association. I'm the state liaison for the state of Nevada for NATE. Um, I realize my commentary and requests are not actionable today. However, I would like them entered into the record for this meeting. Our request is for the telecom infrastructure workforce to be clearly identified as tier one workforce in the COVID-19 playbook for the state of Nevada. Um, currently, you know, the work we do is critical to the communications infrastructure of our state, as well as to national security. We work on maintaining and installing telecom towers, telecom technology on the towers, in building distributed antenna systems, and so forth. Our work includes contracts for custom and border patrol, for the first responders network, for the public safety network, and of course, for carriers such as AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon, et cetera. Our work is especially important in the state where the schools are being accessed remotely and over 300,000 students and 35,000 teachers rely daily on network performance. Small businesses are often operating remotely and the entire state's population is using the wireless communications infrastructure in more critical capacities than ever before. Our men and women in the field work in teams and there is no way to do our work and keep socially distant. If one member of a team or a crew gets COVID, the entire crew is quarantined for two weeks. This is interruptive and dangerous to our state and nation's security in many ways. In the current playbook, critical communications infrastructure is listed as tier one, but telecommunications workers or telecommunications workforce is not clearly defined. Just yesterday, I was denied a vaccine, even though I had an appointment through Southern Nevada Health District at Western High School. The Southern Nevada Health District point of contact acknowledged that I seem to be tier one, but to be honest, he was not totally clear. And because we are contractors and not direct government employees with government ID. I have to stop you right there. My we have, you've re reached the two minute mark. So we appreciate Understood. your public comment. Thank you. Well, um, is there additional public comment to be made at this time? Uh, yes, there is. <laughs> Okay, Hello. Please, please go ahead and state your name and make your comment. Okay, my name is Janice Flory. I live at 1462 Garden Glen Court in Gardnerville, Nevada. And um, I would like to compliment the uh, Quad County efforts because I live in, in that group. Um, their, their testing has been excellent, and I'm sure that their... Um, vaccination program will be even better uh, since we're going to be getting uh, vaccines on a more regular ba basis. Um, since I'm in the older group, uh, we have a lot of time to read and watch TV. And uh, I just noticed in reading the new um, uh, guidelines from um, the federal government, from the uh, Biden-Harris report, that on page nine of the executive summary and on page 40 of the complete document, um, they are um, suggesting, I believe, that the um, 65 and older group be considered um, um, more of a priority than it already is. And I would appreciate um, uh, you having some consideration uh, because for many months, you know, we all asked for the federal government to be involved. That really didn't happen. And now it is. And they wrote a document. And I just think it would be nice if everybody would be consistent. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you all. Hello, am I on? Uh, you are. One moment, please, okay. before we go to additional public comment. I just want to state um, clearly, uh, there's, there's, you're, you're welcome to provide any public comment that you want, um, but there's no requirement to give your, your address during this public meeting. So please don't feel obligated to do that. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go to the next individual now. Okay. okay, my name is Anthony. I'm a 76 year old senior from Henderson. Uh, first of all, I wanna say, I wanna basically applaud uh, the team uh, effort for the great job at Cashman. 
Uh, we had our first vaccination on Sunday the 17th. We had friends go on Monday, and we had other friends earlier than that. But the first five days were phenomenally done. I mean, it was amazing. And I just have to say, you guys did a great job. We we were so impressed. Of course, all accountability was off, and that's what happened the next few days. Everybody got wind of, way. Hey, well, you just go down. There's no no accountability. So it got to a point where people were just walking in. So that's what happened. But you guys did a great job on that one. I know you're going to be working. I saw media about the QR codes. That's going to work great. Let the applicant do the heavy lifting, enter all their comments, all their information, their data. All we do is scan it in on an iPad and boom, we're in. So I, I'm looking forward to it. Quick, uh, Quickly, I have uh, a quick comment about the uh, second shot. I'm a second shot uh, candidate. I need it on the 14th. I spoke to my doctor yesterday. He said they were looking at a four-day uh, grace period, two days before, two days after but your target should be on your day. That's the ideal uh, efficacy of the, uh, of the I'm, I'm Moderna, which is a four week, 28 day one. So uh, hopefully you guys can get us in on our day that we need. Uh, I'll be looking forward to making that scheduling uh, very soon. Last thing is the registration process. Uh, I diligently work on that every time. Um, right now it's got a glitch. Uh, today and yesterday I worked on it and today was showing the three days, the 30th, you open it up. It has about a hundred appointments there across the day. But when you select an appointment and go to the, uh, the next, the gray, it's grayed out and you can't choose next. So I'm assuming there's no appointments. That's the reason, but it looks like there's appointments. So that was an issue that I think needs to be addressed. Um, Anthony, I, I apologize. I have to I have to stop you there. We've hit the two minutes. No worries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for your comment. Is there additional public comment at this time? I'm going to leave it open for just a few more seconds to make sure we have plenty of opportunities to provide public comment. We appreciate the comment that's been provided so far. Is there additional public comment? Okay, I hear none. Thank you so much for uh, providing public comment. Please know that there's another opportunity to provide public comment at the end of this meeting. Um, we will close out agenda item number two at this time and we will Caleb, go. Caleb? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanna make sure everyone knows uh, we did receive two statements of written public comment. They were sent out to the group and they are on the NV Health Response site. Sorry for interrupting. No, I appreciate that. That's a, that's a great point. Uh, there, there are uh, two, two additional pieces of written public comment that have been provided and um, that was that was provided by Megan. So thank you for reminding us of that, and and we will uh, review those. So thank you. Uh, we'll go now to the approval of minutes from the January 21 uh, 21st task force meeting. Um, again, thank you to the team for working so hard to get these done so quickly. Um, these have been provided for you. If there is um, anything we need to discuss or um, motion a motion to approve or amend. Um, we will consider those now. Okay, Lieutenant Colonel Thompson, I make a motion to approve as written. This is Terry Reynolds. I'll second that motion. Okay, great. Thank you both. We have a motion to approve as written and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed vote? No. Great, thank you all very much. I appreciate that. And this takes a lot of work, especially when our meetings are uh, in rapid succession like this. So uh, Megan and, and others really appreciate that. Uh, we will close out um, agenda item number three and a move to agenda item number four. And we will start with Director Reynolds uh, for an update on enforcement in the state of Nevada. Terry. Hey, love, thank you. This is Terry Reynolds. Uh, really, I have a very short report, but I'm, uh, pleased to announce that in the first three weeks of uh, this year, we've had 100% compliance on, on our first visit. So uh, that really is, is great. Um, 
And uh, I really appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, most businesses are being very compliant and, and working with us. And uh, we are happy to, uh, to help uh, and answer any questions with, through our safety training and consultation team. So uh, thank you for that. Um, and that's all I have to report. Great, thank you, Terry. I appreciate that. Um, we will we will keep going, but want to make sure members of the task force uh, know you have the opportunity to discuss any of these items. Just go ahead and um, and and jump in as we go. But I'm going to keep the agenda moving as as much as we can. So we'll go now to um, Division of Emergency Management and um, go to Chief Fogerson for an update on um, PPE and grant status statewide. Good morning, Dave Fogerson, Division of Emergency Management. We still are working on $138 million worth of grants to our local governments to assist their efforts in the COVID vaccine response and the COVID pandemic, starting with the uh, testing. Uh, some good news we've gotten since the last meeting, we now have 100% FEMA reimbursement for our vaccination efforts. So we've been trying to push this to our emergency managers and our local health authorities to remind them that they can apply for a project worksheet with the Nevada Division of Emergency Management and they'll get 100% reimbursement for anything vaccine related. And that includes, uh, from talking with Lieutenant Colonel Compton this morning, our National Guard, it actually goes back to August. So it'll free up some funds that we'd previously had to allocate for the 75-25% uh, utilization to pay our share. We're now gonna get that money freed for us to use for other purposes we need and get the 100% reimbursement from FEMA. The PPE report is in your packets. We are working on a large push to local governments until we had to close the Northern Nevada Warehouse the last two days because of the snow event that we've had. Southern Nevada Warehouse is still open and we're moving a lot of equipment, especially to Nye County based upon their recent request. We sent out 100,000 gowns, 24,000 face shields, 84,000 roughly by next now kits and 33,000 gloves just in a week to give the idea of the volume that we're moving through that warehouse at the request of our local uh, partners. And then the last part from DEM, we we're really working with FEMA and with uh, Department of Division of Public and Behavioral Health on getting vaccinators and data entry folks out to our counties based upon the requests from the local emergency managers and the local health authorities. We have been able to get some FEMA employees to help in uh, Southern Nevada, the Quad Counties, and in Washoe with data entry. We've gotten some health and human service employees from the federal government to help as vaccinators in the Quad Counties and in Southern Nevada. And we have some FEMA contractors that are in Washoe County to assist with the vaccination efforts. So really trying to push anything we can to help our local partners. They make a request. We push it to try to see if we can fill it either internally to the state. And if not, we ask for federal partners for assistance and have had a great partnership with them. And a report pending any questions. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate that. Um, seeing no questions. We will uh, continue on. We'll go to Leslie Mullenkamp for an update on where we are um, with the CARES Act and other funding sources. Leslie. Good morning, Leslie Mullenkamp with the Governor's Finance Office. Um, we continue to work with state agencies to uh, uh, identify the amount of coronavirus relief fund that remains for the state to use through calendar year 2021. Uh, we, we're also um, continuing to uh, work through um, any kind of additional needs uh, that we may have uh, that could be funded with the program and identify those as well. Uh, so that definitely is keeping us busy. And um, for the most part, uh, uh, that uh, finalizes my report. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Leslie. I appreciate that. Leaving it open just a little bit for um, for conversation. I know we're regularly discussing where we stand on on expenditures and resources that are coming in. Um, I'd like to go to uh, unless Ms. Gonzalez, Deputy Superintendent Gonzalez, has uh, joined us. I'll go to um, Jamie Black, Chief with the Game Control Board, for an update. Chief Black. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Cage. Jamie Black, Gaming Control Board, for the record. A uh, very brief report today. Um, so far for the month of January through the 22nd, the board has conducted 2,564 inspections. We're currently at 209 regulatory cases. 
Um, similar to Director Reynolds' report, we, we continue to see a high level of compliance with our licensees. Uh, I also just wanted to take this opportunity to thank the various uh, local health authorities for working with the board to get its staff peace officers on the vaccination schedule. We really appreciate the collaborative effort by all involved. And that is the end of my report. Great, and there has been, um, there's been progress in, in, um, in that effort, that line since our previous discussion, Chief Black. Yes, there has. And uh, like I said, we really appreciate engaging in the dialogue and uh, getting our folks set up to get the vaccination. So very much appreciated. Okay, great. Thank you and, and uh, grateful to, to local partners for that assistance as well. So thank you. Um, we'll go to um, Director Stapleton with the Nevada Association of Counties. Thank you, Chair Cage. Uh, no real update today, just um, except the counties continue to work really hard to get vaccines distributed across the state and um, recognize how hard everybody is working at the local and state levels. And so thank all the folks at the state for their support and partnership. Great, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, we will continue on with uh, Mr. Harper from the League of Cities for any updates. Thank you, Chair Wesley Harper, um, League, uh, Nevada League of Cities for the record. Um, our update is also brief. Uh, the cities continue to promote the uh, COVID trace app and work with businesses on guideline compliance. Also cooperating um, with counties with respect to coordinating uh, vaccine um, distributions and um, immunizations where collaboration is beneficial. Thank you, end of report. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Harper. And um, to Chris Lake, Dr. Lake with the Nevada Hospital Association. Great, thank you. Um, today, there's about 1,322 cases hospitalized uh, throughout Nevada. 1,228 of those are confirmed cases with 94 suspected cases. Uh, the trajectory is going down throughout the entire state of Nevada and hospital operations are beginning to normalize. We're seeing more and more facilities uh, scheduling uh, non-urgent uh, medically necessary surgeries and a few hospitals also uh, revisiting their, uh, their very strict uh, visitation policies. So uh, that is all good news. Uh, equipment, PPE and supplies are in good condition. And I'd also like to uh, just uh, state that uh, flu is currently not a, uh, a big issue with the hospitals. They're not compete, flu patients are not competing uh, for resources. Currently we have about four patients with flu in the hospitals throughout the state. So um, that's all good news. Uh, COVID is accounting for about 24% of the uh, hospital occupancy at this time. So that uh, concludes my report. Great, I, I appreciate that, Chris. And just um, you know, just looking at the numbers, and um, you know, as often as we are talking with the media and talking with Kyra uh, and other folks at the state, um, you know, we 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 see the numbers decreasing, uh, and and that's not just in hospitalizations, but that's also in cases. Um, that's very promising. Um, we we're still at numbers that are much higher than than we would like. Uh, and we want to make sure we're doing everything we can to, to support. And I know there are a lot of great efforts out there to, to assist um, the hospitals in, in, in making sure they have um, plenty of capacity. But positive news, as we'll get to here in a moment, um, and, uh, but we, we still have a ways to go to, to come down from the, um, the peak of where we were at. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, even though the trajectory is going down, um, we are still at high numbers with the, uh, the number of patients hospitalized are still currently higher than the, the previous peak. Um, just to put it in perspective, we're going the right direction, but we are still seeing very high numbers. Great. Um, I appreciate that. Um, unless there is any further discussion on um, this agenda item. I, I appreciate the updates. I think it gives us a great opportunity to just um, check in and um, provide information to one another. Um, obviously we have uh, three significant um, uh, updates here. Um, the current situation report, the state vaccination update, and then the local vaccination update. I'd like to 
um, go now to um, Hira. I know we have some folks at the at the local uh, the locals who will be um, giving us uh, updates on um, number seven, and some of them have meetings uh, later in the day. So I'd like for us to um, go through um, the current situation report here with the state biostatistician, uh, and then um, we'll go to the um, COVID vaccine distribution update with Candace McDaniel after that. So, um, Kyra, if you could provide us an overview. Yeah, and I can go probably fairly quickly today, um, just because as everyone has mentioned, numbers are looking a little bit better and there's not anything super noteworthy. So um, if we could jump right into the first slide. I hear we're looking at our case trends. Uh, we've seen a sustained downward trajectory since about January 8th. Um, Average daily new cases is about 1,144. Last week, that was just under 1,500. Um, so you can see the improvement there. Next slide, please. Here we're looking at testing. We continue to see a decline in the test positivity rate as well. We're sitting at 18.6%. So again, uh, still very high, um, but we've seen decline for the past two weeks, uh, just very slow decline. And we do have some differences across the county still. And I have some slides later on to talk about that more specifically. Next slide. Here's looking at hospitalization data. I think Dr. Lake had one um, more recent day than, than I do here. This is two days ago. Um, and so I won't go into detail on the numbers, but again, you could just see um, the charts at the right showing that downward trajectory. And I believe this is the ta first task force meeting where we've seen that um, again across the state. We've also started to see ICU and ventilator use decline statewide, um, specifically started declining in Southern Nevada as of January 19th. So um, again, first time we've been able to, to say statewide improvements, not only in hospitalizations, but in ICU and ventilator use. Next slide. Here we're looking at mortality data. Mortality data still appears to be peaking. It's kind of showing some uh, variability. We're averaging 18 to 20 deaths per day over the previous three weeks. Um, we had reached, I think, up to maybe 23 deaths per day on average, but it's kind of bouncing around a little bit now. So, so not quite um, on a downhill slide there. Um, we anticipate um, that this is probably, you know, we're probably gonna start to see that turnaround. So maybe by the time I give an update next week, we'll start to see some, um, improvement in our mortality data. Next slide. Here, um, again, we're looking at test turnaround time. These data are as of January 1st. We're still averaging two days across the state, and then you can just still see pockets, specifically with Quest, taking a little bit longer. And then um, similarly, same counties, uh, Churchill and White Pine are having, you know, kind of the, um, the longest time frames, again, specific to Quest. And then more detail is on the next, next slide here. Um, so here you can actually see significant improvement compared to last week. We have uh, over 68% of labs turning around in two days. So actually 70% about, uh, which is pretty good. A, a couple weeks ago when I was presenting, I think that was around 50%. So definitely seeing improvement across the board in how quickly those tests are getting turned around. Next slide. Here's the county tracker as of Monday. Um, still seeing almost all of our counties being flagged for elevated disease transmission. Story and White Pine are the only two counties that aren't flagged this week. Um, but again, a lot of those numbers are showing improvement. It's just that we were so kind of far above those thresholds that it's gonna take us a while to come back down. Next slide. Here's just some detail. I probably won't go over it. Um, for every county like I did last week, but you can just see kind of across the board which counties are showing improvement. At this point, it's probably easier to name the counties that are still having, um, you know, that, that aren't showing improvement than to name the ones that are, which is a good sign. Uh, but in general, you can see Nevada in the upper left-hand corner kind of peaked out and is showing improvement over the last couple of um, weeks now. And then the next slide, this is for case rates for 100,000, I'm sorry. And then the next slide looks at the same data for test positivity rates. Again, you can see Nevada kind of coming down a little bit, but really kind of sitting at a plateau. Our, our test positivity is still really high. Um, the World Health Organization, again, goal is 5%. So even where we are showing improvement for the last two weeks, we're still over 18%. 
Um, and then again, you could just see the variation in, uh, across the different counties. A lot of improvement across the board. I mean, we had a couple of weeks where we had some counties at you know, 40, 45% test positivity. I think our highest county now is in the low 20s. Um, so definitely not good, but again, showing improvement. And then the next slide looks at, um, you know, counties, how much testing is being done in the counties to make sure we're testing a sufficient amount of the population. And you can just see certain, some of our smaller counties don't meet that threshold. It's typically the same counties that don't have a lot of disease burden. And so we see, you know, when cases are lower, it actually drives the testing demand to go down a little bit. Um, nothing really particularly concerning here. And then I think the next slide is our prison comparison. Again, not significant changes if we exclude the prison population. You can still see um, most of the areas that are flagged continue to be flagged if we exclude those populations. Esmeralda and Mineral Counties um, are the two exceptions um, that would actually be removed from elevated disease transmission if we excluded um, prison populations. And you could just see the details uh, in those two tables. And I think that's all I have, unless there are specific questions. Thank you, Kyra, and, and to your team as well. I just want to sort of reiterate what I said a moment ago and, and um, see if there's any discussion or items that we need to address on it. Um, as far as the um, as far as the overall assessment and the overall trend, it's fair to say, and I'm asking, not not telling, but would you say it's fair to say um, we are we are moving in the right direction? And you address this throughout your presentation. We're moving in the right direction. We're still at very high numbers um, for uh, the things that we're measuring here in the state. The things that we found to be critical. Um, for responding to um, uh, the, the, the virus in the state. Um, however, um, we're moving in the right direction. We need to maintain uh, what we're doing so we can continue to keep that trajectory going and, and dig ourselves out of this um, place we're in right now. We, not, that, not that you have to agree with every aspect of that, but is that overall correct? Yes, I, I think that's exactly what I'm trying to say. Um, this is really the first time we've seen a sustained downward trajectory uh, in this uh, peak or this wave. So um, similar to what Dr. Lake said, our numbers are still high. They're still more than, you know, what we had seen in our, our summer wave, but they're significantly lower than what we were experiencing in uh, November. So That's excellent. That's excellent. I think with that and the update that, you know, the updates that we've been hearing, um, about enforcement at the gaming properties, the resorts, the enforcement in the, the general community, um, the, the um, um, movement of the PPE and the, the partnership with the counties and the cities. And uh, of course, Leslie and, and her work on um, making sure that um, we have the resources we need from uh, financial resources we need. Um, overall, um, pretty good news right now. And we need to, we need to keep this um, keep this moving in the right direction because we do know, uh, as we've seen before, things can turn um, pretty quickly. So I appreciate that. I'd like to open it up to members of the task force and see if anybody has any additional comments. Okay, thank you, Kyra, and to you and to your team. Um, we'll go ahead and close out agenda item number five. And um, I'd like to turn it over to um, Candace McDaniel and open up agenda item number six. Candace, if you could provide us an update on um, the state vaccination effort, I'd appreciate it very much. I think this is what a lot of us, there's, there's obviously a lot of interest in this. So please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Director Cage. Uh, Candace McDaniel from the Division of Public and Behavioral Health. Um, I know there's a lot of information out there related to vaccines, including what can be seen on national data sets versus what we are experiencing in our state. And we are close to a year into this pandemic and anxiety is high and people rightfully have a lot of questions on the vaccine. As we have said from the beginning of the vaccine response, this is a complex logistical planning process that has required the state and all of our local partners to work together to reach Nevadans and ensure those who are eligible to get the vaccine, they know that and are able to make an appointment. Um, each week, doses are received in Nevada, and they are being sent to and used by our counties, providers, and pharmacies. We are working to vaccinate as many Nevadans as we can as quickly as possible with the doses we receive from the federal government. 
the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, their public facing webpage, reports of 174,367 doses administered. But as of January 27th, yesterday, um, we are able to see within the Nevada WebIZ, WebIZ system what's been administered and reported as 210,173. So there's an obvious lag in reporting for this public facing data. Of the total allocation delivered, there is a portion sent to CVS and Walgreens for long-term care and skilled nursing facilities. That total allocation is set by the CDC based on the bed count of facilities and the number of staff. There are 670 facilities included in the long-term care pharmacy program. 530 facilities have received vaccine and have been scheduled with CVS or Walgreens. This program began December 21st of 2020, and this strike team delivery mechanism is critical to protect the most vulnerable Nevadans. The efficiency of this process compared to a mass vaccination event is very different, but we are ensuring that this critical need is met. Doses allocated that are not used with this project will be transferred for general population use with the close of the project in the coming weeks. We will continue to ensure that all vulnerable populations living in these facilities are accounted for and that doses are available for them through this strike force effort. Um, but repurposing doses will help us provide more doses to seniors and workforce populations as part of the state's playbook. Nevada is ordering first doses of vaccine up to the federally allocated cap, but only ordering second doses in the quantities requested from our vaccinators as needed. The second dose of Pfizer vaccine can be administered after 21 days, and there is a 28-day minimum interval between the first and second doses of the Moderna vaccine. These doses are being ordered as we approach the time to use them. We are closely tracking when folks are due for their second doses, and we are ordering each week exactly the number of second doses we will need for both the Moderna and the Pfizer product. Those second doses are allocated in earmarked for Nevada and are sitting on shelves waiting for us to order them. For Nevada, it makes much more sense to have Moderna and Pfizer handle the storage for, for these second doses until we are ready to order and to use them. They are the experts at ultra cold handling and storage. And when the second doses are stored with the developers, there are fewer concerns with temperature excursions or other handling complexities. I think what is really critical to understand is that a new shipment of doses um, you know, does not come to a provider with labels for first or second. These vaccination partners receive a bulk shipment and it takes a workforce of, of individuals who need to process to plan and thaw for both the first and the second dose events while updating all of their appointment opportunities. As we look forward, we can expect the federal government to include additional retail pharmacy partners begin to provide vaccines statewide with the use of a federal allocation versus our existing state allocation. We also look forward to an increase in our weekly allocation as the federal government has supported an increase at the national level. We saw our first increase in allocation to order from to be delivered next week of 42,625 dose first doses compared to the 36,000 from the previous allocation. We hope to see a continued increase in supply to meet Nevada demand. Thank you for allowing me to provide more detail about the vaccine response today. Great, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Um, like to um, open it up to discussion from uh, members of the task force about um, what's going on with um, vaccination. If there are concerns, questions, considerations, things that we need to discuss um, based on Candace's report. Caleb, this is Terry Reynolds. I just wanted to comment that um, there was a press release uh, that came out with a number to call uh, to coordinate uh, for people to get information via vis-a-vis uh, -vis county, different counties on getting vaccines. And my wife is uh, helping an uh, elderly couple in their 90s uh, get, get appointments. And um, she found that the person that was on the other end of the phone extremely helpful. It was, it was great. So uh, I really wanted to uh, say that's a that's a great service. Encourage people if they have questions to to use that that service. So um, it's very very good, and they're very knowledgeable, very helpful. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you 
uh, for setting that up and uh, seem to be a good resource. Yeah, I appreciate that, Director Reynolds. Um, I know we have uh, Deputy Administrator Peak on or, or Candace, if we could talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment. But, um, you know, one of the things that we're finding um, and we're hearing from around the country is, of course, um, you know, there's there's large segments of the population that are uh, that can access um, things like um, phone apps and can access uh, health care through the internet. There are some that, that, that is more difficult to, for, uh, for them to access these resources. And wanna, we want to make sure that um, we are doing everything we can to make sure we have an equitable distribution um, of this vaccine throughout the state. And I know that's something our local partners are committed to as well. Um, and so we've heard um, time and again on, on a couple of technology needs that um, we've been working on and, and I'll turn it over as see Julia has turned on her camera. Um, Julia, if you have anything you'd like to provide or, or Candace with respect to Terry's comment. Yeah, first, thank you, Terry, for that feedback. Um, it did start Tuesday at 8 a.m. It is a statewide call center um, to really help Nevadans um, make the appointments. Uh, the main source of information is our Immunize Nevada webpage. So again, Nevadans can go to that page and um, look at appointments themselves. We've heard in public comment, folks use that as well. Um, but if they're struggling at all and have questions, it's truly great to use that 800 number and they can walk you through the process and or help you uh, make an appointment yourself. At this time, it is really difficult to make appointments just because of the supply issue. So um, though they can help navigate that, um, we do have a supply issue, as Candace noted as well. Um, if you're not able to get an appointment, they're going to help you express interest through that portal as well, so that when there is an opportunity for you to get tested, the local health department will have your information and has the opportunity to reach out. But um, again, it's it's a statewide tool. We hope that it will be helpful. If there's feedback on how to improve it or any issues experienced, please let us know. Um, it is going to be continuous quality improvement. It's only been live a couple of days. So um, any feedback to make it better or more useful for our residents is appreciated. Thank you, Director Cage. Thank you. Julia, how do, how do people find out more about this? Where, where, do they, where would they go in order to access uh, the number and the other information for them? Uh, we will be putting out a press release with all the information um, and also highlighting Immunize Nevada as well. We did want to give it a couple days to work out all the bugs be before we do major promotions. Um, it did go live, as I said, on Tuesday. Um, we got it 210 calls by lunch the next day as it was promoted by our local partners. We had over 400 calls by lunch. Um, and so uh, I'll say next week is when we were going to look at doing the major promotion. So encourage folks to watch out for that. And we will be doing it on our uh, media calls as well, highlighting that. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. I um, want to make sure I'm not talking over anybody else here. Um, not, not seeing any other um, members offering input right now. Um, Candace, one of the things we've been uh, dealing with with the press quite a bit lately and uh, members of the media and, and through our, our weekly press calls is the, um, the actual um, start to finish the flow of the, the vaccine um, product, for lack of a better word, from um, the, the warehouses <clears throat> um, through the federal supply chain into the state, um, from the state to um, local or, or partners, and what that looks like. And, and we have asked our local partners to um, provide uh, information next and in, in the next agenda item. And so it'll be good to hear their perspective here in a minute. But um, one of the things that um, you and I are on a lot of calls together multiple, um, multiple times a day um, with partners throughout the state and throughout the country. And one of the things that, that is interesting is, you know, we, we have been, um, well, why don't I um, let you talk about it and, and let you talk about where we are with respect to allocation from the federal government, um, kind of the governor's letter and uh, where we are on feedback and response from, from there. Yeah, thank you, Director Cage, Candace McDaniel. So um, I can use some of our data from um, Monday morning, essentially. So just to really support this whole process is we get an allocation. Um, we work with the counties about what is to be ordered. We confirm that, we order, and then it's delivered starting on Monday through Wednesdays, typically. And so what's reported at the federal level is, you know, those doses that have been delivered. 
So um, when you sort of like look at the CDC website and, and you see what's posted, et cetera, um, you know, it, I think it's really important to understand where all those things come from. And so the previous number that we had been working with, um, what we have to remember is we're pulling out those doses that have been allocated initially for the long-term care facilities. So that is a total of 81,900 um, of both first and second doses. Um, from there, then we look at the retail pharmacy. So we essentially are doing this bridge project before the federal government turns on they're a very large retail pharmacy that will be supported by federal allocation. But we wanted to sort of ease our way into that and really improve and, and increase the access to the vaccine um, based within a pharmacy down the street. And so what we have to look at is after essentially that long-term care allocation is um, almost taken off the top and that is the numbers are provided by the CDC as I had previously mentioned. Um, we order all of their first doses, which of, as of Monday morning was 210,800. Um, all of those have been ordered and delivered um, and in the process of being used. Um, we also have essentially a, a matching allocation for second doses. And so of that, um, the second doses were like 144,475. And that supports our cap, our state cap of 355,275. Um, of those second doses that were allocated, we ordered 45,675, all based on the need for those second doses for the, both the minimum intervals for, for both Pfizer and Moderna. So if I've lost you, please don't feel like you're alone. Um, it's an incredibly complex system um, of, of truly seeing what's available to which entities it has been sent. Of that, what are the first doses? And then what are the second doses? And so um, some of that sort of lag in, in second doses needed is really based on time periods. So we are looking at for what we've already been allocated, and um, we're actually looking into the future of second doses. So we are looking into almost the second week of February of what we are allocated, as I mentioned, sitting on a shelf that we just don't need yet. And so that really represents, you know, the full allocation of what Nevada is given. Um, so, you know, IP had previously mentioned, it's still, it's still ours, it's still for Nevada um, individuals, and we just order it as, as we need based on the timeline. Um, some of this conversation around truly and how the governor supported, you know, more clarity around how do you get um, to our allocation? What is that formula? Um, what population are, is being used? And so, Obviously, we have two products where one is only for individuals 18 and over. Uh, for Pfizer, we're, we're able to give it to 16 and 17 year olds. So when you talk about that age group, we're talking about kiddos who are working in childcare centers or working in grocery stores. So there are individuals in our state who are 16 and 17 who have actually received the Pfizer product um, in some, you know, in some particular counties. Um, but we're really talking about with with this clarity from both the CDC and Health and Human Services, um, you know, we really wanna know what that, what that formula looks like. What is the population you're using? When you go to the CDC page um, of what they actually promote as the distributed per 100,000, they're using the total population, what it looks like to us. And so um, with the support of the governor and our federal delegation, we have been asking a lot of questions this, this last week you know, please share with us what this allocation is. And then we also really supported this conversation, uh, as I previously mentioned um, in other calls, you know, it's really difficult for these partners you're gonna hear from very shortly to only plan a week in advance. Um, when you're standing up pods and the scheduling and the appointment system and the staffing, it's really difficult to do on a week by week basis. And so we've really been promoting, like, please give us a projection. You know, what can we, what can we expect in two weeks' time and three weeks' time? Um, that really does promote um, the planning process for our partners, but it also really provides a lot of clarity for the public. You know, what to expect. I know we all get that that question of, you know, when will we hit certain certain groups? And that's really, really impossible to do with the weekly allocation. So we're really hoping some additional clarity, a little bit more of a projection. Um, on top of what we really truly hope to be an increased allocation um, will, as I, as I previously mentioned, will we'll support the planning process. And then also um, a lot of public information for the Nevadans who are asking 
um, when when things will happen. So um, I'll stop there for questions, but that's um, hopefully a, a good deep dive for everyone. I appreciate that very much. Um, do we have um, do we have questions or comments um, from members of the task force regarding this update from Candace? This is Megan worth and I just want to thank Candace and her team. This is a heavy, heavy lift, and she has been phenomenal throughout. Um, so I just want to put that on the record. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate that. They have been incredible. Um, and and we received, uh, as as um, as I we said, I think yesterday during the press call, we we received um, uh, an update from FEMA and HHS in our in Region Nine yesterday um, that Nevada has the highest percentage of doses um, distributed in in arms, so to speak, in uh, in Region Nine, and is among the highest in the nations for for distribution. So. A um, lot of work um, that uh, has to happen in order for that to happen, and um, and uh, as much as uh, I appreciate and admire what uh, Candace and her team have done, uh, an awful lot of that work is um, with our local partners and through our local partners and what they've done in order to build capacity to distribute this very important resource for our state. So, um, with that, I'd like to go ahead and and once again thank. Um, Candace for her update here and um, move on to agenda item number um, seven. And uh, I know we have um, Carson City listed on there first, but I'd like to start with uh, Washoe and then we'll go to Carson City next um, for, for scheduling purposes. So um, we'll go ahead and open up agenda item number seven. I see uh, members of um, uh, Washoe County are, are available um, and um, We'll go ahead and, and start with 7B if, um, if you're available and ready. And Megan, are you able, this is Lisa Lockridge, are you able to share, we can go ahead and share our screen? Just show um, our you, you should have access, uh, but let me work on it from this end. Give me just a second. I think I, I, think I got it here. Perfect. Okay, can you, do you see it? We do see it, you're good to okay. go. Okay. Good morning, everyone. This is Jim English with the Washington County Health District. Just to give you some perspective, I am the Regional Operations Chief for our Incident Management Team here in Washington County. I oversee five branches as part of the COVID-19 response efforts in our region. Those include enforcement, REMSA EMS, human services, recovery, and public health. I am also the branch director for public health, which of course is the largest operation in this response. With me this morning, I have our community and clinical health services director for the Washington County Health District. She is responsible for overseeing the COVID-19 testing and the vaccination efforts. And her name is Lisa Lotritz and she will be doing the second half of this presentation. So the... So just so everyone knows, I'm gonna give a brief bit of background history. The Washington County Health District activated our crisis action team and went into the ICS structure on January 17th, 2020, in response to tracking the novel SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 disease. We have continued to wrap up since that date. On March 17th, 2020, the region came together under unified command and we created the regional incident management team. The health district is part of the health branch is coordinating the efforts for all vaccine response inside Washington County. We are working extremely closely with the state immunization program with every step of this process to make sure we're in step with them. And I do wanna take this moment to thank uh, Candace McDaniel and her entire team. I know that I bother them and reach out to them almost 24 seven as part of this response. Furthermore, we manage the appointed dispensing activities throughout Washoe County as part of the incident management team. So as you'll see here, I'm sure this task force is extremely aware of this prioritization lanes. 
in conjunction with the state of Nevada, we updated our vaccine playbook to match the states and go into the prioritization lanes. It has been a communication struggle with the public that continues to refer to tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. The Washington County Health District is concentrating on the left-hand lane with the frontline essential workforce process because we have a strong scheduling system and we have regional partners that are willing to step up and right now target the general population of which we are working in the 70 years and older right now. So you hear a lot about pods, the point of dispensing pods. There are two large pods that are permanently or semi-permanently set up in the Washoe County. One is our pod at the Reno Sparks Livestock Event Center. That is the large equestrian center here at the county. The other one is down in South Meadows, and that is run by Rene renowned Regional Medical Center. Furthermore, we have the retail pharmacy vaccination program up and going. In Washoe County, we have 12 pharmacies that are currently providing vaccinations to the over 70 population. Safeway is another pharmacy that is providing vaccinations to the ineligible assisted living facilities and group homes that are outside the federal program for assisted living facilities and skilled nursing. Furthermore, we have various community strike teams that we work with, namely our fire agencies, in some hospitals to set up pods when vaccine is available. Community Health Alliance is another group that we're utilizing for community-wide pods. From there, I'm gonna go into the large Reno Sparks Livestock Event Center pod. It's a multi-organizational multi operation. So we have the Air and Army National Guard. We appreciate all the all the efforts the National Guard has given Washoe County throughout this response. This morning they were on site at 4 a.m. with my other teams clearing snow. In the last two days we've cleared over 16 inches of snow at our location to continue operating. The Guard does all our logistics, all our traffic, controls our entire upper lot of the parking lot that you'll see next. They also do all our screening and now they are currently assisting in vaccinations. Our community emergency response team is a group of four to seven volunteers that help with our recovery lots and traffic control. We're using the medical reserve court, uh, corps for pharmacists and vaccinators and also medical screening and recovery. Um, we actually appreciate the governor's directive allowing uh, dentists and veterinarians to now give vaccinations. We do have one veterinarian that I'm aware of that has been volunteering a tremendous amount of their time. Of course, we have the Washington County Health District. REMSA is supporting our waiting lot, and we have multiple contracts with temporary employees. So this is the large-scale Reno Sparks Washington County Health District pod, and this is the layout. I'll go through this really quickly. So if most people are aware of the Reno Rodeo. This is where this event is held. It's owned and operated by the Reno Sparks Convention Visitors Authority. This location is centrally located inside Washoe County and inside the city of Reno. It, it has easy access to Interstate 80 and 580. And at this time, I'd like to thank NDOT and our city and regional partners for assisting in all the snow removal around the property to assist with that. We are utilizing close to 560,000 square feet of this property. In some of those buildings, we have PPE storage, we have other supplies to continue to run the regional operation. What you'll see from the north is the first split between the light green and the, the dark green lines is, that's where we split when we do testing and vaccinations on the same day. The red line is our emergency access and exit in case we have any emergencies or need to move people from the north to the south. The next four lanes over that are light yellow or lighter green, those are de dedicated vaccination lanes. We have two buildings there set up for vaccinations that you'll see later. The far right hand lanes, the dark green lanes, those are hybrid lanes that we do both testing and vaccination. So in our morning operations, we test and vaccinate. In the afternoon or evenings and weekends, we only vaccinate. Those large lines, when you get through the last screening point, we can stack approximately 220 to 250 cars 
of which we move a car through a vaccination approximately every two minutes, 25 seconds. We had a lot of lessons learned because of the testing that we ramped up all summer. So what you're seeing right there is the top end of that large parking lot on our first pod. There are about 240 cars there. The National Guard mans that and they actually direct which lanes to send cars so that no one has to wait any longer than necessary. Next, the next photo is two of our three buildings and you'll see the roof structure that's been designed. This was the first day of snow we got uh, Monday that really wasn't bad. This entire operation is modular. There's nothing anchored in the ground and it can be completely moved to any location within Washoe County. So I have two pictures here, briefings. The one under the roof structure, that's our nursing vaccinator briefing. You'll see the National Guards there and our nursing supervisors and our other vaccinators. The other large uh, briefing, that is all the safety and support people running all the logistics, the parking, the safety, the screening. We have the National Guard in that briefing. They completely control our North lot and they communicate back and forth with their leaders. We learned a lot again through testing. So those buildings were custom designed based on all the input from our staff that did COVID testing all summer long. We have worked through multiple different designs and setups. What you're seeing there is the north end of the building in the one photo that has no individuals there. That is where our, our volunteer pharmacists spend their entire shifts, either diluting visor vaccine and drawing vaccinations or they are actually um, just drawing the Moderna vaccinations. The green vest are our volunteer pharmacists and we use the tan for our vaccinators. These are just photos out in the North parking lot. I do wanna thank the state of Nevada for all their efforts in getting us funding. Every piece of the emergency response the infrastructure that we've asked for, we're currently utilizing. We have our emergency radio system up and going with information regarding the vaccinations, the process, how long it'll take, what to expect, what to do if you have adverse reactions. This other photo with the golf cart, that's where the guard begins the screening to ensure that everyone has all their paperwork in place. I didn't mention on the last slide, but we have 10 lanes. We can stack another 500 cars in, of which we've dedicated three for people that have improper paperwork or didn't bring it and then the other ones we have that have their paperwork complete. If you come with your paperwork complete, your um, visit here is at least 20 to 30 minutes less. The last slide is just our 30 minute and our 15 minute uh, parking lots. The, med, uh, the community has understood the importance of staying. I would say we're at an excess of 99% for people staying at least 15 minutes in our parking lots. We actually have nurses that assist the guard with screening along with their medics. If they've determined based on the, the vaccination questionnaire that someone needs to wait 30 minutes, we put a post-it on their windshield and therefore they're directed into these lots based on that. You also see an ambulance there. We have REMS on contract to uh, provide emergency assistance and we have greeters walking up and down these lots, checking on people, helping them assist with their VSAF safe um, access and also explaining how the scheduling and the information for the second doses goes. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Ms. Lisa Lotritz to complete our presentation. Good morning and thank you for having us today. So um, I will start with vaccine distribution. Uh, we have ha we have, ha have allocated to Washoe County 38,635 doses. And this is as of our allocation that we received on Monday, January 25th. Um, from that, we have dispensed 31,913 doses. And most of our pods, we schedule um, Wednesday through Sunday. As Candace mentioned, um, when vaccines delivered, we wanna make sure we have that in our hands. So um, most pods are Wednesday through Sunday. And uh, so that doesn't count for the pods that we already have scheduled this week or that we're um, right in the middle of doing one right now. Um, so we are, uh, and it also indicates what's been entered into WebIZ. Um, we are currently at about 83% on our data entry for Washoe County. Next slide, okay. 
scheduling. Um, Washoe County scheduling process, we are using our electronic health record, Patagonia Health, and I will discuss it more in the next slide, but we have a public facing scheduling system and uh, people are able to go on and if they're in, uh, if it's their time to be vaccinated, they can go on and schedule an appointment. Um, if necessary, we are able to have people call in to schedule as well. Um, our community partners are using uh, different scheduling systems. Renown is using MyChart, um, and some of our community, community Health Alliance has another scheduling system that they're using. What we've um, talked to our partners about is the importance of um, opening it up to everyone. So anyone that is distributing vaccine in Washoe County right now, they, are, they have to have that available for everyone in the community, not just their patients. So um, if someone doesn't have a MyChart, there's a system for them to uh, members to be able to get one. Um, uh, Community Health Alliance, their system, anyone can sign up for that as well. Um, we also, the Washoe County um, Health District has created a senior interest list. And um, I'm gonna show you our website here in a little bit, but um, seniors are able to go on and get on our waiting list um, so that we know that they're interested in getting the vaccine. We had that go down to age 65. Um, we currently have 25,000 individuals on this list. We are only pulling individuals 70 plus um, when we, we have a pod. We, um, we send them an email if need be. If there wasn't an email address, we call them. If their name is pulled, it's a random selection from the, the list of 25,000 and we advise them that um, you've been pulled, you can schedule for vaccination. Um, we've also used this list for our community partners that are doing 70 plus pods and there we are able to give them names from this list um, to vaccinate as well. And along with that, we are um, utilizing um, Human Service Agency, Reno Housing Authority, and different community partners to ensure that we're reaching everyone in our community to, in, to maintain vaccine equity. Today is the first day of our homebound program. Um, so every, this week it's just Thursday, but starting next week, it'll be Wednesday and Thursday. We have a team, um, it's one of our nurses and RIMSA that are going to six homes. We're using one vial of Pfizer for each day to ensure we use um, every bit of the vaccine. And from our senior list, from our partners that have homebound clients, we um, have a list where we uh, make appointments and schedule them for us to go to their house. And then in three weeks, we go back for their second dose. So next, data entry. Um, as I indicated, we are using Patagonia Health. Uh, they created a mass vaccination app. And with this, there's the public facing scheduling that we can do. And we also use it for inventory and direct um, reporting to, to Nevada WebIZ. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our partners Renown is using um, MyChart and <clears throat> our fire partners and Community Health Alliance, um, they're all doing direct input into WebIZ. So how will people know when it's their turn to be vaccinated in Washoe County? So I'm going to try and show you the website. You're, you're not able to see that, are you? You might need to stop sharing, click on okay. the link, reshare. Okay. Got it. Can you see it now? Oh, not yet. How's that? Okay. <laughs> so this is our dashboard. And at right at the top, there's a link for senior 65 and older to, um, to click on. And I'm, I won't waste your time, but I'll just show you what that looks like. Maybe. Oh, it's going to be slow. So there's a sign up sheet and it asks name, date of birth, zip code is key for us because just um, recently Incline Village um, wanted is vaccinating 70 plus. So we're able to pull by zip code um, to give them those names for their area. 
And then email is preferred, but if they don't have it, we have a phone number and we can reach them that way. Sorry, this is so slow, okay. Um, so down, when you go down further, it does, it um, outlines lane one and lane two. And if um, the public clicks on lane one, geez, sorry, um, it shows what this includes. And when they when they go down to each of the um, the bu the bullets here, it shows them what is bolded is where we're currently working. So if it's bolded and underlined, these people are invited. And um, same for frontline community support. So we are currently inviting through Nevada system of higher education. And then if they're not bolded, we haven't reached these groups yet. And it goes all the way down the left lane of the prioritization lanes. And so if a business or an employee wants to know, well, do they know about my business? So I'll just type in one. Let's see here. Hopefully this is gonna work. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. It, it, so the, a, they can put in their business and usually it will um, it will go through and list all the Walmarts that are uh, have been that we're aware of. And if they say, hey, my business isn't on there, they can request to participate. And um, they will they can put in the information. It doesn't automatically make a change to our list, but we look at that and say, oh, yes, you're right. And we can add it on our end. Um, also, when you we the left lane kind of is the same um, outline where our seniors and our general population can go through and get information. Um, and then just to go through, this is just this is where we're still perfecting. Um, this is just what we have at Washoe County Health District. So we up this on a daily basis. Um, and it, but we would like to be able to show it for all of Washoe County, but we're not quite there yet. Um, and then am I eligible? I hope this works. And um, they can take the survey. And they, are you a healthcare worker? They mark yes. And it tells them, you know, what that includes. You are eligible um, and click to finish. So then they would, um, they, they can then know that they, all ours is based on employers, so they need to contact their employer to get signed up. We don't, unless there's uh, certain circumstances, sign up individuals, so it's all going through their employers. One other thing I want to show you about our website is updates. If um, someone wants to uh, wants to be able to get daily updates, they put their email address in, and then they're signed up, and we will send them our daily updates, which is one of our headers up on top. There's also vaccine information. And then um, right from this screen, if they need to schedule a test, um, they can do that as well. Um, and it's English and Spanish. Um, and our hotline number, if someone doesn't have internet access, they can call us and we can help them over the phone. So the only other side I have is questions. So I am, um, I can stop sharing and take you back there, but if happy to answer any questions that you have, just let us know if it's a question directed for myself, which is more vaccine related or operations directed more for, for Jim. Well, um, this is Caleb Cage for the record. I'll turn it over to, to Dave Fogerson, who I think has a, has a question uh, here in a moment. Um, I'll just say, um, I, I think, all of us and members of the public benefit from seeing um, not just the, the tremendous work that you're doing for um, your community, uh, the community I live in as well, um, but also how absolutely complex it is um, for managing such a um, major process for the whole community. And so I just wanna commend you for that. Um, you know, I think, um, all of us are looking for ways to improve and all of us are looking for um, uh, opportunities to improve. And, and certainly a lot of your current efforts are um, uh, based on um, a lot of your lessons learned from 
your time doing um, the testing operations, which are still underway. Um, but uh, just, just it's, it's an impressive operation you're running. I know we'd all like more doses. I know we all want this to be distributed uh, citywide or countywide more, more quickly, but um, really, really impressive operation you have and um, uh, impressive outcomes. So thank you for, for doing that. Um, I'd like to open it up at this time for other members of the task force to ask questions or comments. Dave, did you have something? Yes, Caleb, Dave Fowers, Mr. Record. I, I just wanted to echo your statements there about the outstanding community partnership that uh, Washoe County has been able to pull off by working with all their, their county partners. And just want to make sure that you guys know that anything Division Emergency Manager can do to assist, whether it's the 100% FEMA reimbursement funding that we can help you with. I know you're getting some money from uh, on the health side for the vaccinations, but anything we can help support there. And also start thinking more uh, support for people, logistics, all those things that we're helping you with, with guard employees, FEMA employees. We do have some uh, inoc immunization folks that are on site there today. They got there last night and we're working with the medical advisory team in the state to try to see if we can utilize them as vaccinators for you. So anything you guys need, please reach out. Same thing goes for all the other counties. Nice Thank work. You. Our, uh, all that FEMA support staff is here today being trained and briefed on our operation. We truly appreciate it. And I would never think the health district would need things like plow blades. So we tremendously thank uh, State DM for supporting some of these odd purchases that uh, normal public health agencies don't need. But based on expiration dates of vaccine, we can't just cancel, nor can we easily reschedule people. And you can imagine calling 700 people to say you finally got in and now we got to push you back. Doesn't go over well. I can imagine that. This is Caleb again. Um, any other members of the, um, the task force like to provide um, comments, questions, otherwise for Washoe County? Okay, hearing none, really appreciate the um, presentation, uh, Washoe and, and the work you're doing there. And I look forward to continuing continued partnership going forward, especially as um, the um, uh, federal government continues to um, move increased numbers of doses of the vaccine here and um, help us get it out further and faster. So thank you all, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We'll go now to um, Carson City Health. I see um, Dr. Jeannie Freeman is on. If uh, you can go ahead and um, provide us with your update. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for letting us join you today and to provide you an update of where we are with the Quad County vaccinations. Um, some different statistics I'll be providing for you. And I did share our talking points with Megan earlier this morning, so she may share them with all of you as well, just so that you have that update on a regular basis. We received our first vaccines the week of December 21st, and we held our first event on Christmas Eve as a present for those who themselves an opportunity to have the vaccine. To date, we have completed 24 events across our region, which expands more than 3,000 square miles. And many times we're having two events on a single day. Our events range from 100 doses to a little over 1,300 doses uh, at each event, depending on the setup that we have going on that day and the location that we're at. So we've had walk-in events and then also drive-through events similar to what you saw with how Washoe County has set up theirs. Our events are supported by volunteers from organizations such as Team Rubicon, our Community Emergency Response Team, volunteer firefighters, uh, sheriff's offices, their search and rescue, as well as their citizen patrol. We've mm -hmm. also had assistance mm -hmm. from private mm -hmm. providers, uh, healthcare providers who've come out on the weekends mm -hmm. and during the week to vaccinate uh, others in the community. We've had Division of Public and Behavioral Health Community Health Nurses helping out, staff from federally qualified health centers, and then also our local hospitals and the National Guard. Our greatest highlight, one of them, was actually this past weekend on Saturday, January 23rd. We did 1,362 vaccines in the snow, and we had over 40 volunteers that contributed over 430 hours of time. We only had five paid staff working that day. The rest of the event was all operated with the help of volunteers. So as of January 25th of this year, uh, which is just five weeks into our efforts. We've received 7,175 vaccines for the Quad County region 
and administered 7,041 of them. On Tuesday of this week, we received 1,600 vaccines, which five of them, or sorry, 500 of them are allocated for second doses and the rest are for first doses. We did actually cancel an event earlier this week up in Story County in Virginia City in collaboration with the county leadership due to the weather. And we have those folks rescheduled for Monday. So we're ready for that. To date, we have wasted zero doses. And that is a goal that we strive to maintain and uh, we work very hard with that. Many times it means that we're staying after an event for an hour and a half or so, so that we can call people who are on different community wait lists who are eligible for the vaccine and get them in for their doses so that we do not have any waste. Each week, we are actually increasing our vaccination capacity as demonstrated by our first and second dose administration. And we are on track to be ready for when the allocation increases to the state to be able to do that thousand vaccinations every day of the week for the Quad County region. We are preparing for that increase. We have HHS vaccinators, federal vaccinators that are coming in and will be here early next week. We have some assistance from FEMA with their blue shirts who are here starting tomorrow with us and they'll be helping with data entry. We are excited to say that CCHHS is up to date on our data entry when it comes to our vaccinations. We are making that 72 hour time period and we're appreciative to our state agencies that have sent staff to help us get caught up on that backlog. And we're now into that rhythm where it helps us with that. We were using our electronic health record and um, having the data transfer from our electronic health record over to uh, WebIZ. We are no longer using our electronic health record because we're not doing any billing of any administration fees or anything. And that actually increased our efficiency with data entry significantly. It used to take us a little over five minutes per vaccination to enter into our electronic health record. And now that we enter directly into WebIZ, it takes us less than two and a half minutes. So that increased our efficiency quite dramatically. Currently, the needs that we've expressed to our state agencies um, have been supported. Fiscally, we're getting support with subgrants through Division of Public and Behavioral Health. Additional resources from the federal government have been uh, provided to us through DEM. The governor's office has been responsive to our request regarding occupancy, excuse me, occupancy rates for facilities that can be utilized for vaccination efforts. Immunized Nevada has been a powerful partner with us when it comes to messaging. We've actually hired a logistics support staff member to help us with securing additional locations within the Quad County region that we can set up as semi-permanent locations to serve our communities on a more regular basis rather than us. Right now, we're sort of what we call the traveling uh, roadshow. We travel around and we pop up uh, small events. It's kind of like food truck pop-ups in our communities, but that's what we are kind of doing with our vaccination events. And it gets extremely exhausting with the weather and everything to be doing that. So we're looking to set up more permanent locations. We will be starting our homebound program in the next week uh, so that we can work with our senior centers and those and get out into our rural communities with those who are truly homebound. We are looking to hire a volunteer manager. We've had so much support from the region with different folks who want to volunteer that we truly need to have a volunteer manager that is helping with that. The collaboration across all four counties and the independent cities that we work on projects to support the region has been truly uh, inspiring, which has been shown since the beginning of this when we started back in February of 2020. We are preparing for vaccination efforts for our future groups, including those in the Tahoe Reno industrial area of Story County and their numerous shift workers. So we're in the process of building multiple teams so that we can make sure that we're able to meet the people where they're at at the time that they're there, which is important for us to be able to provide that access. So we will be doing vaccinations probably in the wee hours of the morning, midnight to 2 a.m. so that we can make sure that we're able to get there with the shift workers and we can accommodate what their needs are. Like everyone else, we have areas for improvement, but we're constantly working on solutions. So questions that you may have for me and the Quad Counties. Thank you very much for that uh, update as well. Um, Jeannie, I appreciate that very much. You were, you were providing uh, a little bit of oversight about your, your effort for um, home residents who are home, homebound in the um, Quad Counties. Can you tell us any more about um, your plan and your efforts to date on that? So we're working on having uh, strike teams available. Part of that is gonna be in assistance with the HHS vaccinators that are coming in, but then also our staff working with our social service entities in each of the counties, and then also working with our senior centers and the Meals on Wheels. 
those are truly the entities that know the homebound um, best. But we're also working with Division of Public and Behavioral Health, the Public Health Preparedness Program and Melinda's team and uh, using the Empower mm -hmm. data. And there was some updates on how the Empower data can be utilized. And um, we have the ability to look at the heat maps and help us know those who um, may have greater risk and that of uh, those home serving them. So we currently uh, generally receive the Moderna vaccine, but we uh, know that we can do that. We have the, now that permission to be able to transport those punctured vials as long as they go in a single direction and they don't get returned to the refrigerator and stuff. So that will be a scheduling process that we will do similar to what we did with flu vaccinations in the fall, which was part of that effort that was pushed through Immunize Nevada. Um, where the Immunize Nevada program and then all this, also the state IZ program was there was funding that came down to the locals to practice with pushing for the flu vaccination in an effort that the COVID vaccine wasn't gonna be here as quick and to help us prepare. And that was one of the things that we did. So we're gonna be making some modifications to the plan that we had done with the homebound with flu vaccination so that we can do that with COVID. One of the other things that we're also doing, uh, Chair Cage, is that we are reaching out to our um, leaders in our Latino population to mm -hmm. get some insight as to how we can reach out to our um, Spanish speaking groups to make sure that they know that they're eligible and to make sure that they are also getting the information that they need and that they're able to ask the questions about vaccine safety. And that becomes really important for us, especially with our migrant farm workers that we have within some of our agricultural communities. And so forth. So we wanna make sure that we are reaching everyone and making sure that that access is not just for those who can um, speak English, but that it's accessible to everybody. Thank you. I know I, know, um, I have some questions. I see uh, Dave has unmuted himself. Any uh, Dave and anyone else? Dr. Freeman, the, the work you guys do in the Quad County, it just makes me proud knowing that that's where I came from before I came to the state service. So the, the efforts that your folks are doing to reach that large, diverse population over the, the geographical area you have to deal with is phenomenal. The ability that we've done in Clark and Washoe to build those uh, the super sites where people can come makes so much sense to those larger communities, but your ability to reach out and hit those diversity populations and using the empowered data that you guys started doing back in April or March when you first pulled it are really good. And that I'm going to say odd hours. I mean, most of the, the U.S. thinks of eight to five as normal hours of work. But in Nevada, we got to start thinking about how we get those second and third shift employees. And you guys are already on the, the road towards that. So any support you need and anything we can do, just like I told Washoe, you guys are doing great work. Anything that Division of Emergency Management can support you with, with the additional FEMA staff, the funding mechanisms, or the guard staff, please ask. We're ready to help you. Thank you. That is one of the things that our internal team has really kind of taken some feedback on. Uh, we, we've requested a lot of input from the different industries that we're currently serving who are eligible for vaccinations about what would be appropriate vaccination time. So for example, for our educators, didn't make sense to have our events from 10 in the morning till two in the afternoon. So we've scheduled our events so that they're um, from three until six and sometimes until later and on the weekends so that we can make sure that they don't have to be out of the classroom in order for them to get their vaccination. So it doesn't cause any additional workforce challenges for those schools in the district. Great, thank you. Are there other questions from um, members of the task force about the Carson City Health and Human Services vaccination effort to date? Okay, great. Um, I can follow up with you uh, offline, Dr. Freeman, on any of the questions I may have. But like we said to, to Washoe, this is um, it's a really challenging enterprise and we're really grateful for your partnership in all of this. So thank you to you and please thank um, Nikki on our behalf as well. So appreciate Thank that. Thank you. Great. We'll go now to um, Southern Nevada Health District. I see uh, Misty has turned on her camera. Misty, if you'd like to provide us an overview and update on um, the vaccination effort to date in Southern Nevada, that'd be great. Yes, thank you, Director Cage. So this is Misty Robinson, Senior Public Health Preparedness Planner with the Southern Nevada Health District for the record. Um, as of January 26, 2021, 
There have been 107,190 COVID-19 vaccines administered in Clark County. The Health District is working with the region's type three incident management team to assist us in our uh, vaccine administration efforts. To date, the Health District has received 96,375 doses of COVID-19 vaccine for distribution in Clark County, in addition to facilities who are receiving direct shipment of the vaccine, such as pharmacies and hospitals. With the assistance of the Nevada National Guard, our jurisdictional partners, and soon Region 9 FEMA and Health and Human Services teams, the Health District and partner Points of Dispensing are currently operating to administer vaccine at Western High School, our Decatur Public Health Center, Cashman Center, Sun City Anthem Center, uh, Jerome Mack Middle School, UNLV, College of Southern Nevada in Henderson, and Canyon Springs High School, Boulder City, UMC, and a pop-up clinic site today at the Flamingo Senior Center. Additional locations are listed on our website at www.snhd.info COVID, or slash COVID, I'm sorry. Uh, we have to remain flexible due to vaccine supply. We are currently vaccinating healthcare workers, public safety and security, and frontline community support occupations down to continu uh, continuity of government. In Clark County, this includes teachers who teach kindergarten through third grade only, um, NSHE frontline educators, uh, community support frontline staff, such as shelter workers, social services, and those that, su that support vulnerable populations. At this time, public transportation workers are not being vaccinated, but they will be uh, the next group to be included when we expand eligibility. Uh, within the general population lane, we are currently vaccinating individuals age 70 and over, and we have identified specific locations for this group that are easily accessible for that population. We will gauge the availability of appointments as well as our vaccine inventory and resources as we make decisions to open vaccine availability to additional groups. We post vaccine updates to our website each week. And as we work through each uh, priority group, the availability of vaccine and updated clinic information will be provided to the public. Information provided will include how and where the vaccine will be available to people in each group. Regarding second doses, uh, the Health District and the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority announced that we will be opening a second dose clinic site at the C1 area of the facility Central Hall on Tuesday, February 2nd. Um, the appointment only clinic will operate Tuesday through Saturday for people who receive their first dose at a health district clinic and are eligible to receive their second dose. The health district has started notifying people who are due to receive their second dose of the vaccine. People receive a link that allows them to schedule an appointment at the clinic. SNHD has developed a new integrated appointment and registration system, uh, which allows people to schedule their second dose when they are receiving their first vaccination. As our resources expand, we expect our second dose vaccination site options to expand. Um, and that is my report, and, and I'm open for any questions. Thank you very much, Misty. I appreciate that. Um, one of the things we've been talking with you a lot about or, or with um, the health district and Clark County Emergency Management about is um, uh, the, um, the lag, for lack of a better word, between the shots and the paperwork and getting caught up on the data entry side of that. Um, can you give us an update on, on where we are uh, with, with that process to date? Yes, I can. Um, as of yesterday, we had approximately 14,595 uh, vaccine administ administration records to be um, uh, entered. We are working with the county and our, uh, our federal partners to help with the load on that, and we should be up to date by next Saturday. And that includes those that are coming back to us. And then with our online registration system, um, We'll be able to um, to do this electronically without the without the need of the the paper backup. That was going to be my next question with the online piece. That that should that should um, should solve that problem. That's that's awesome, and I know um, I know that's been a um, a uh, um, challenge with respect to the um, uh, all of the communities that are doing this because of the the data entry. And I know. I think Dave said that there were 64 FEMA folks who were uh, on the ground throughout the um, throughout the state. So hopefully that that helps us along with our our guard folks. So 
Um, I have other questions, but again, don't want to don't want to necessarily dominate the, the conversation here. Does anybody else have any questions, members of the task force who'd like to ask questions or um, make comments? Chair Cage, Dave Fulverson. Misty, same as what I said with Jeannie and with uh, with Jim, you're doing a phenomenal job down there. Your collaboration, especially with getting Clark County Emergency Management to add additional sites and kind of manage those with the individual cities. That way we add such great depth, you know, for our goal of doing two thirds of Nevadans within uh, six months with the vaccination, the real effort goes to you guys because of the population. So we're looking at 15,000 shots per day and you guys are really close to being able to do that if we can get you the, the vaccines. So I appreciate all that collaboration you're doing. Uh, I know that today, this morning, you guys were training the National Guard members on how to do that data entry so we can get rid of that backlog and maybe get caught up on that. And the FEMA employees are down there working with you and filling in behind the Guards members because we can't have the FEMA employees do the data entry quite yet. And even more props that you guys are sharing the resources with Knight County because we are having to shut down the Cashman Center because of lack of vaccine. So you guys are reaching out to Nye County to see if we can move those uh, guard and FEMA employees over there for the assistance. And, and that is the, the nature of Nevada, the community partnership. And I really appreciate that. And anything we can do to help support you guys further. I know we're meeting with you guys Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays with a whole bunch of us from the state, but anything we can do to help support you further to make these goals work for you, all you got to do is ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that, Chief. Um, I, I'd like to ask, um, you, you mentioned during your, your remarks, um, you said you had, I believe, a number of um, sites that were set up specifically, and I want to make sure I, I hear this, I heard this correctly, you, you said you had some sites for vaccination that were specifically set up for, um, I, was it vulnerable or 70 plus or elderly population so that they could access um, the site more easily, is that, is that correct? Yeah, for the 70 and older population, yes, we have specifically dedicated um, sites for that. We have had some mishaps where others have been able to access appointments that were not in that age group, but um, I'm looking through here real quick. Um, Henderson, in cooperation with Sun City Anthem, is doing a 70 and over clinic this week. Um, the uh, Flamingo Senior Center is also one that, that we're targeting the 70 and older popula population. Um, and we have been doing a senior center uh, every day this week from Tuesday through Friday. Um, and then we're trying to ca capture with our, our SNHD pods those, those uh, 70 and older populations as well, including our Decatur location and Jerome Mack Middle School and Western High School. Great. Do you, does it, does that plan lead into a uh, plan to address the homebound population as well, or is that separate or, or do you, what's the plan for the homebound portion? We're working with home health agencies right now to identify those folks and we'll probably use empower data as well as, as Dr. Freeman mentioned. Um, and that's kind of our, our plan going forward as well using the home health agencies with the empowered data to identify where they are and, and build a plan in order to, um, to distribute. Okay, for, the, for those populations in the future. Okay, um, other members of the task force have um, questions, comments you'd like to make for Southern Nevada Health District? Okay, I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Misty, for providing that. and. Um, please thank the, the team at the Southern Nevada Health District in Clark County um, for, for all the work you're doing. And I know we've got some um, a long road ahead of us, but uh, I think the capacity that you all have built um, with the Cashman Center, with your partnerships throughout the community have been, um, have been really fruitful over the last few weeks. So really appreciate that and look forward to continuing to, to partner with you in the future. Thank you, Director Cage, and, and um, thank you for allowing us to present on our vaccine operations. Great. Thank you so much. Um, unless there is additional comment, um, would like to go ahead and um, close out agenda item number seven and move to agenda item number eight, which is public comment. This is the second public comment that we have 
uh, for our meeting and a reminder that no action may be taken upon a matter raised under this item of the agenda until the matter itself has been specifically included uh, on an agenda as an item upon which action may be taken. Public comments may be limited to two minutes per person at the discretion of the chair. Comments will not be restricted based on viewpoint. Um, as usual, as we said previously, um, there's a dial-in number on the agenda. Um, please dial that number, uh, dial that number in and enter the meeting. And um, when you're ready to provide public comment, press star six, identify yourself, um, provide your public comment. I'll stop you at the two minute mark and then um, press star six again to put yourself back on mute. So at this time, I'd like to um, ensure that uh, we have an opportunity for members of the public to provide comment during this meeting. I'm not hearing any. I want to make sure that we have um, um, addressed any lag that may be occurring between our, our meeting and the, um, the YouTube version of the meeting that members, some members of the public may be seeing. Um, but I will pause for a moment longer and see if we have any public comment at this time. Chair Cage, this is Megan. I just want to note that no other additional written public comment has been received during the meeting. Great. Thank you, Megan. And a reminder that uh, that we do have the two pieces of written public comment that are available on the website. So, um, okay. Not hearing any public comment, we will close agenda item number eight. And now we'll hear a uh, motion to adjourn. Dave Fowers and I motion to adjourn. This is Richard. I second. We've got a, we've got a motion and a second to adjourn. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Thank you all very much. We'll talk to you again soon. Have a great week.